Let's talk to retired submarine captain Ryan Ramsey. Uh, Ryan, a very good afternoon to you. Thanks for joining us. Good afternoon. Thanks for having me on. Um, very, very unusual, this story, isn't it? I mean, the Titanic seems to attract an awful lot of, um, you know, curiosity seekers, I suppose, if you want. James Cameron, um, the director of the movie, uh, sent a submarine down, I think, an unmanned one, some years ago. And there was another project, I think, on the go around about the same time. Um, looking at this vessel on, on the surface of the water before it went in, it doesn't look particularly... Um, you know, incredibly strong and, in, and incredibly sort of robust, does it? Is that my unseaworthiness coming through? Or what, 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 what can you tell us about it? No, I, I think you're absolutely right. I think there'll be a lot of questions as to um, the actual capability and whether it was, it was capable of achieving achieving that particular descent. Um, so it's an independently made uh, vessel, carbon fibre, I believe, by design. Right. Um, and, um, yeah, I mean, it's a hugely risky uh, activity to, to travel down that deep. I mean, the pressure alone, once you get down to those kinds of depths in the sea, would suggest that you need something which is very strong on the outside. I, I, yes, I agree totally. So you're talking about 400 bar of pressure at 3,000 metres, which is which is absolutely considerable. Mm. Um, so, and I, I can see that it's, it's obviously done operations in the past, but we, we don't know how deep it's gone or how many it's done of those. Um, but um, hopefully they'll have managed that risk as they as they plan this mission. Right. And it seems to have gone missing um, for no apparent reason. There's no there's no indication of, of why it's no longer trackable. But I was I was hearing this morning another report suggesting it doesn't have a distress signal. Is that even legal? Uh, well, so there's there's the question about legality uh, out in the middle of the ocean is is a is a very lengthy uh, topic to go into. <laughs> but but you're absolutely right. Whether it has whether it has um, set, SOLAS, which is safety of life at sea, um, met the standards required of that, I don't know. Mm. Um, the, the communications, I mean, if you piece it all together as best we can, it's, it's gone down, uh, it's probably suffered some form of um, defect or problem to deal with and they can't recover from that. Um, so, uh, and like you say, there's no emergency boy to uh, to release to in order right. to let people know that they're actually in trouble. Right. And and I mean, as far as the actual physics of it coming back up to the surface, I'm told that they could sort of fire their tanks, as it were, to, to float back up. But does that depend on whether they've got power? It does indeed. So everything revolves around having power, unless they've got some form of mechanical release for those for those particular things. But I think it's a bit more, um, you know, it's, it's a bit more complex than that. So mm. just the tanks alone won't be enough to enable its surface. Right, and I mean the Titanic, as I say, has has been a sort of curiosity, um, hasn't it, for, for ever since it, ever since the event itself, ever since this, it set sail uh, on that fateful day uh, back in 1912. I mean, what is it about the Titanic? Do you think that that sort of fascinates people so much? Yeah, it's, it's a really good question, and I think um, it's romantic. Um, it's a very, very well-known story of tragedy, and, and people do become fascinated with it. Um, the, the fact that adventurers try all kinds of things, so the ones that go to space with um, Elon Musk or with um, Jeff Bezos, they're exploring the boundaries of what, what humans do, and I think this is another example of that, which in this case has tragically mm. gone wrong. Yeah, I mean, although it's a slightly more kind of, I suppose, self-indulgent one, this, isn't it? Because this is a bit of kind of very expensive tourism, that if you can afford a quarter of a million quid to go into a very small box to go down and have a look at the Titanic. I mean, I'm not sure... I mean, you'd have to have an awful lot of money to want to spend that kind of money on doing something like that, but I'm not sure what they would have seen if they would have managed to make it down to the ocean floor. Well, I, I think that it's fitted with um, searchlights, so they would have seen some of it, but you'd never be able to conceptualise the the, um, the whole Titanic. You'd just see pieces of it. Mm. I mean, you'd, you'd need huge amounts of light in order to be able to, to show the whole thing. So, um, yes. And so is the community, the submarine community, if there is such a thing, um, generally looking upon this as, as a bit of a, a fool's errand, as tragic as it may be, that it's not something you would want a lot of people to encourage, be encouraged to do? Yeah, so I, th I think there's two ways of looking at this. So the submarine community um, around the world, whenever there's a rescue for, for submariners and submarines, they pull together and, and use uh, rescue systems that are universal ac across the um, across the world. Mm. Uh, however, in this particular case, like you say, it's, it's consumer um, or, or tourism. 
um, and it's a submersible and the submarine service can't really help in those those particular areas. There's, there's not a lot we can do to, mm. to, to support them in this particular case. No, of course. Rather than describing it as a fool's errand, I think a, a, a mission that's gone wrong, yeah. a um, tourism that's gone wrong, and, and um, yeah, my, my thoughts are with the families. Of course. But, I mean, one of the things I find fascinating, and I remember speaking to people who had been... There's been a couple of missions like this down into the Mariana Trench where there's so much about the sea that we don't know, you know, in a way that the, the space exploration programmes have actually discovered probably more about what's around the planet than what's actually under the surface of the sea in it. That, that's absolutely correct. So, so the, the, um, I, I, I wrote about this uh, a while back, that the, the sea is less explored than space. Yeah. And yet, it holds vast amounts of um, potential for for, for for the human race. Mm. Um, and yet, we don't we don't invest enough time um, researching it and making sure that we, we make the most of it. And, and the sea can be a really horrendous place to operate. You, you have to really, really respect the sea as a mariner. It controls you. You don't control it. You just get to operate in its environment. Yeah. Oh, absolutely terrifying. I mean, I remember my parents once came to see me when I lived in New York. They came to see me on a QE2, um, and they had a storm on the way, and they were like, they said, never been more frightened in, in our lives. You know, sort of 50-foot waves, this huge ship just going up and down like this, crashing down. And I've done a bit of sailing in my time, just, just relatively sort of, you know, recreational sailing. But, you know, the sea can just turn. Like, like on a yeah. sixpence, it suddenly goes from, you know, sunbathing on the deck to, to sort of holding on for dear life because a squall has come over and a tiny little cloud has caused you to, to almost hit the rocks. It's, it's terrifying. It, it really is. And, and operating under the sea, uh, as I've done for, for, for a great proportion of my life, um, is, is the same there, that things change instantaneously. The characteristics of the ocean that you're travelling through or operating within can change mm. really, really quickly. And so, you, so full respect has to be had for the sea and you have to operate in it safely. Yeah, so could there have been something undersea, like an undersea current that changed that could have had an influence on what happened here? Um, potentially, but I think at that depth, you don't see too much current activity. I, I suspect that it's been a mechanical or electrical failure of some kind that has led to complete loss of uh, electrics or a potential break in the pressure hull itself, which would have resulted right. in explosion. So... Right. And I mean, as much as it doesn't sound as though there's much that we can look forward to here, is there, is there any kind of hope, hopeful sign that, that you would look for to see, to see that they're still actually, you know, alive? So I think, I think the only thing would be some form of communications, and we haven't had that. And, mm. and the reality is everybody's talking about the oxygen's reducing or they've only got 48 hours yeah. left. The reality is the carbon dioxide is the uh, thing that will... That, that, that ends this totally because they can't get rid of the carbon dioxide as quickly as as, as they might need to, and, right. and that takes takes human life. And if they have managed to re reach the surface, but nobody can find them on the surface, what could they do then? I mean, would that would the, would they be at least safe if they were on the surface? They, they, they definitely would be safer. So if they if they're on the surface and the weather conditions permit, they can open the hatch even for a short amount of time, which changes the air within the um, yeah. with, within the submersible itself, and that enables survival for a bit longer. Um, but then you're still into the potential of you know you're trying to spot a needle in a haystack mm. to try and find this thing. Yeah. Um, and um, yeah, if if they're on the surface, they will be found eventually. But um, in my heart of hearts, I don't think that's the case. Yeah, well, we'll keep our fingers crossed as best we can do. Ryan, appreciate your time. Thank you very much indeed. Ryan Ramsey, retired submarine captain.